Amelie, it's lovely to chat to you today for She Can. Tell us about yourself and what you do. Okay, so I have um, two hats on. Um, one is I co-own a media platform um, where we bring together those sort of world most famous speakers and to discuss sort of current topics that matter. And sometimes that's an Oxford Union style debate with a moderator in the middle and two people for emotion and two people against emotion. And let's say, I don't know, we need to bring Putin back from the cold. Uh, sometimes it's a sort of a cultural format um, where we have sort of also different kind of speakers arranged. And it's, it's, it's always more than the box standard book talk. We always, we call it sort of intellectual entertainment with civilized aggression. We always try to have a sort of tension moment and excitement and a sort of narrative curve um, throughout the whole sort of panel discussion. And I think people come to get entertained, to learn something, to be provoked and, and sort of go, then go home and continuing the, the debate in their homes. And and especially with sort of newspaper polarization, we really try and always present the different viewpoints to a problem um, so that people can really make an informed decision. And even if that means putting somebody um, from the right wing party and putting somebody from the left wing party on the panel, even if we disagree with their views. Um, but that's, that's sort of really important to us that we also sort of and help to break these echo chambers that that sort of you know that have have become I think a, a real problem of our time. Um, so we have a real mission there to to sort of inform and educate. And that's a sort of media company with with an exciting team of young journalists and and, and sort of um, it's a very diverse team. And it's run by the ex editor of Time magazine. And, and so that's one thing. And then with my other hat, I'm an art advisor. Um, that's a company that is my own company called Vedel Art and that I founded um, a long time ago, I think by now something crazy like 20 years ago. And um, there's also a team and we um, advise curators and um, collectors, collectors mainly on what kind of art to buy and we help them build up collections. We curate exhibitions and um, we also organize talks about art. It's sort of more maybe an office for art because we do a lot of things around art and culture um, as sort of advisors. And um, yeah, and that's also sort of fun and international. And, um, and we look also the great thing about being an art advisor that you can really sort of like a detective, you can roam the entire world and sort of find the things that you get excited about or, or that you believe in. Um, and it gives you a lot of freedom. It's not like, for example, a gallery where you represent 12 artists and then those 12 artists is, is what you have to sell. Um, so I think there the art advisor is a, is a wonderful job to have in this sort of art world ecosystem, so to speak. I agree, Amelie. Thank you for sharing that two super exciting hats. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to the stage. So I, I always um, tried lots of things and, and through trying something and then realizing it's not for me. And, and that's how I found my path. And um, I was never the sort of person in school who was like, okay, I want to become a nurse or I want to become this. And I always, you know, changed my mind every single day and, and had all these sort of different ideas. Um, so I actually studied, started studying a com com comparative religion um, something very different and, and, but then changed subject and then studied um, economics and, and history of art, which in a way is the perfect combination if you want to have a commercial job in the art world. And so that was sort of leading me to then work for different arts and institutions, trying out, you know, I had a gallery for some time. So I try, I learned and, and, and sort of realized 
that I love working with artists, but that I want more freedom, as, as mentioned earlier. So I decided the gallery is not for me. I worked for different museums. I worked for other art advisors. And then I sort of found my path to launch my own art advisory company, um, which was definitely um, a right decision. And I can only encourage everyone to start their own companies if they have a sort of entrepreneurial passion. And um, so that's the sort of art side. And um, at the same time, and I think all my entire like, life, I've always loved listening to smart people. I loved going to conferences. I was always somebody who read a lot of books. And um, I think that led me also through to Intelligence Square, this company that I now co-own. I started by going to attend the events and I got involved in the company. Then I launched their franchise in Hong Kong together with um, my friend Jana Peel, who's also now of one of the co-owners of the entire company. And um, that made me sort of um, really get involved in there. And so I must say, I, I feel I'm incredibly blessed. And I think if one has the luxury and if there's a way to turn one's passion into, one, in, into a job, I think then there's probably always a high chance to succeed because it's sort of, you know, everything you do is going to be driven by this personal passion. And so in my case, I really made these sort of my two favorite things, my, my two sort of jobs in a way, or my two professional sort of paths. And um, yeah, so that's, I think, in a nutshell, how I ended up where I am now. And I think that's great. I mean, tell us a little bit, what are your superpowers? What do you have that makes you successful in those two roles? It's always very difficult and because um, I don't necessarily think I have the sense of a superpower like somebody who is incredibly talented in, I don't know, mathematics or physics or who is very fast at learning languages. I think my main skill is probably having a good sort of people sense. I'm a people's person and I love spending time with other people. And I think if you start a company, it's only going to be, and the, whole, the success is really going to be based on the team you have. It's not only the person who's running it. It's, it's really in the end, it's the team. And, um, and if you have an A-plus team, I think no matter, no matter what you decide you want to do, I think with an A-plus team, you're always going to, be, you're always going to succeed, even in a, in a very dense market. You can always be better than your competitors if you've got the right team. And I would say that's probably something I've always been good at. At, at finding um, the right team members and finding the right people I, I, I love to work with. And, and, and that sort of, and it, that keeps me also motivated to have a happy, committed, passionate, driven team. And I think that's what drives everything forward um, that I do. And I think that's the case for Intelligence Squared, where I think we have a great team. And it's also the same for my art advisory company, Beetle Arts. So I think the sort of people skill and, and managing, finding the right employees, I, that's, I think, is key no matter what you do. And I think there I, I ha have probably at least a good sense of how to create these successful teams. Um, and then otherwise it's because I'm sort of, you know, this is driven by my passion. So um, I have, a, I just have over the years, I have sort of just built up a lot of knowledge in the sort of field of culture. And that is, you know, more art focused on the art advisory side and maybe more literature. And, and sort of thought leader focused on the intelligence squared side. But I think it's just also just that knowledge. And I think also sticking to, sticking to something you have started and allowing just over time also to build up things because nothing is happening overnight. And I think being an entrepreneur is, is there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of, you know, 
times where things don't go well. And of course, they're constant disasters. And I think it's just that slightly high pain threshold um, and that you just keep going. And I think while you keep going, you increase your, your learn, learnings. And I think that's sort of, um, I, think that's, I think that's the last thing I would say that I probably have a high pain threshold to just keep going. And an enormous amount of patience, yeah. And patience, yes. Amelie, what are your top tips for other women? I think my top tips would definitely be um, take your time to try and figure out your passions. Because if you can somehow turn your passion into something that you can make money with, I think that's a recipe for long-term happiness. And I think it's probably also, it's not a guaranteed success, but I think it, it, it gives you a high chance of success. And, you know, as I said earlier, I really believe in, you know, just surround yourself with the right people. Um, I think that's absolutely key. And I think it's that confidence thing. I think because I think if you, and, um, if you enter something with confidence, um, and I think if you sell yourself with confidence, because in the end, every, in every job, it's in the end as a sales job, you're always going to have to sell something. It's yourself, it's your product, it's your advice, it's whatever you do. I think find a good person that trains you to be a good salesperson if you're not naturally good at sales. Um, but I think that's definitely also, um, I think it's, it's always a good exercise. Absolutely. Amelie, last question. Um, where do you see yourself in five years time, do you think? So for me, I think I wouldn't be able to say, you know, I've got two companies that I, one that I co-own, one that I run. I, there's nothing more, you know, I don't want to start a third company. Um, I don't think I want to, want to in, in, may, I don't think I want to even scale my current companies. I think they are all just in a very good manageable size. Um, so for me, it's me, what do I still want to achieve? And that's more on the content side. So um, for example, um, I would love to sort of work on the perfect art institution. You know, at museums at one point were supposed to be the churches of the future. And, um, and I think art is still, you know, a very important sort of breeding ground for new ideas and new thinking and for society sort of reform and for change. And I think museums have failed to be these places. I think you have all around the world, you have these sort of cultural diplomacy institutions from the French Institute to the Goethe Institute, and that we're supposed to also be these places of exchange. And I think they are failing. I think the only thing people do is they go for German classes there. Um, so I think to work on a sort of cultural institution that connects um, different people from different walks of life that are truly interactive um, where art can sort of inspire and change how people think, that I would find a, a wonderful and challenging thing to work on. And, and, for, and for Intelligence Squared, it's probably a similar thing, you know, the sort of conference um, that, you know, engages all the sort of world thinkers um, and brings them together now that you also have the sort of virtual world and, and just creating new kind of, you know, learning content, I think that people can sort of digest and maybe get excited about in new forms. I think it's a sort of kind of, um, and sort of frontier thinking, I think that keeps me going and, and that I sort of, you know, would love to be a part of these kind of developments or think about them or maybe start something like that. And so I think that's sort of my, um, and that's my sort of goals. Um, I think we'll watch the space, Amelie. I can see it's brooding. More things will happen, which is super exciting. Thank you, Amelie, for sharing that. And thank you. And it was lovely to chat. And um, yeah, bye-bye.